Chapter 20 The Powerful Forces of Corleone You're listening at NovelFull.audio Lyle opened his eyes as the chirping of birds that had perched themselves on the roof woke him up. He had only slept for a little bit, but it was enough for him, well, at least it used to be. He felt sleepy and tired, but he had to get up. The first thing on his mind was to move out of the inn. He got up and got dressed before going to the corner of the room to retrieve his things. He had hidden a suitcase where his gear was located and a spatial ring. He quickly transferred everything over to the spatial ring that he had taken from Ilya as it had much more space. The one that he wore only had two cubic meters of space, which, although plenty to store important things, was simply not comparable to the one he had right now. Even the ring he had, the lowest grade of a spatial ring, was incredibly expensive and Lyle had forked out about 10,000 gold coins for it. For comparison, an average family in the empire would have a yearly income of about 100 gold coins, making it impossible for them to afford such a thing. The empire had over 1 billion people, and even though a majority lived a normal life and simply worked in order to provide for their families, the minority that was wealthy and powerful still numbered in millions. Compared to other empires in the world, the Golden Lion Empire of which Lyle was a part was a middle-ranked empire. The stronger empires not only had a larger territory, but the population was higher as well, especially the two strongest empires of the world. The Empire of the Soaring Sun was led by the most powerful human in the world, Arshavan, the sun-born Ilithil. The other was the Moonless Night Empire which was led by the Empress of the Night, Isabella de Kos herself. The two empires were the two largest empires in the world, but there were three others that were as powerful as they were. The Kingdom of the Dragon King, which although smaller in size and lesser in population was in no way less powerful. The Realm of the Elves was another place where even though their numbers were not as high as the two empires, each of their people had incredibly long lifespans and could live for hundreds of years. The ruler of the elves was one of, if not the oldest living being on the Corleone planet and was incredibly powerful. The final power that was equal to the three was one that was probably even above them individually. The underwater realm that was ruled by the Lord of the Dead Sea was the vastest of them all. The powerful sea creatures there couldn't even be counted while the Lord of the Dead Sea was the most powerful being that none could defeat when he was underwater. Luckily, most of the creatures couldn't go on land and the Lord couldn't fight with his full power on land or air, otherwise, they might have even conquered the whole world simply because of how many of them there were. The Golden Lion Empire had become a middle-ranked empire mostly thanks to the previous duke who was the second strongest person in the empire, his talent, however, was above all and it was a given that he would have reached the realm above titled knight in the future. The empire only had one person in that realm and it was the protector of the empire, the oldest human of the empire that was near his final years. Compared to other middle-ranked empires, they were weaker. Lyle packed and left his room before making his way down to the reception. The receptionist recognized him from yesterday and was quite understanding of his reason for leaving the inn. Lyle told her that he needed to go back home after all that has happened and that he feared the city might get locked down again because of the duke's death. He thanked them for the good service before stepping out and making his way to another inn. He was wearing his disguise as he used the kit he had previously in the bathroom. The first thing he needed to do was to find a place to change his appearance once again before going to the inn. He walked before reaching a restaurant, upon entering it he was seated and ordered food. The food came relatively quickly as Lyle had ordered some simple dishes. He ate it before paying and going to the toilet. Upon entering the toilet, Lyle first locked it before taking out his disguise kit and changing his appearance and clothes. He quickly finished doing it before leaving the restaurant and walking to another high dot class inn. He did the same as before, he found a room that was on the top floor and paid 200 gold coins to book it for a week. The price might sound steep, but the inn was almost full, and so were the upper rooms. Lyle's plan for the coming week was to simply go to the forest every night and hunt monsters. He needed to regain a part of his strength before returning to Orsfold, one of the largest cities in the empire and the headquarters of the organization. 
Lyle could be considered to be part of the upper echelons of the organization, his strength wasn't as high as the others of his rank in the organization, but his great talent and high success rate during mission had been enough for him to progress. The backing of the old man who had recruited him into the organization so long ago was also another factor. Lyle had only met the man thrice after the initial encounter. The first time was after he had finished the training and was introduced to the organization and was about to become a formal member. The second time was after he had managed to progress and join the middle ranks of the organization while the last time was a mere two months ago when he had risen to a high dot ranking individual in the organization. The old man was one of the top members of the organization, a shadow. There were only four shadows in the entire organization and each one was as powerful as a titled knight or archmage. Compared to a titled knight or archmage, however, a shadow was weaker in direct combat, but that was because they were assassins and their main way of fighting was by using a stealth attack to kill the enemy in one hit before leaving. Not only was Lyle not close to a shadow, but he wasn't even a knight blade, which would be the equivalent of tier 3 for assassins. Of course, Lyle was different as his vampiric side allowed him to fight a knight of the same tier evenly, while his transformation boosted his strength to be almost equal to a knight blade for a short period of time. Spending time in the restaurant allowed Lyle to find more information about what had transpired after he left the city. The royal soldiers had taken over the castle and the whole city, they were quick and efficient and nobody had left the castle yet. All of those that were part of the Duke's entourage are probably jailed right now, the soldiers have probably been able to find any documents that they needed to link the Duke with the enemy as well. Lyle thought as he entered his room. Ilya's chambers will definitely be searched as well, the old bastard has probably put formation after formation to protect any important things he had, the soldiers will probably be unable to crack the formations and if a formation expert doesn't come, they might suffer the backlash or even get the documents and other things he had hidden to be destroyed. I would love to go and try to get some benefits, but I can't, the commander is a peak golden knight, even back in my prime I would have had no chance to defeat him, even assassinating him would have been impossible, not to mention sneaking in right now underneath his nose. Lyle thought before lying down on the bed. It's still morning, I need to get some more rest, and allow my wounds to heal before heading out tonight, I wonder how hard it will be to get out, from what I have heard, the soldiers are not banning anyone from exiting or entering the city, I hope it continues like so until I leave. Lyle fell asleep before waking up after about nine hours of sleep. He had previously woken up in the morning and right now, the sun was starting to set. Sleeping for so long was something that Lyle hadn't done for ages. He got up and went down to have some dinner before returning to the room and checking his gear. He nodded before donning some normal clothes and leaving the inn. He would first leave the city before putting on his gear. Chapter 21 A Weird Caravan You Are Listening at Novel Full. Audio. The gates of the city were still open, but there were still soldiers posted on them. The soldiers were still the ones that Lyle had come across when he had returned from the forest and he knew that simply walking out of the city would be almost impossible. He would simply draw too much attention to himself. One person leaving the city late at night when the world had gone through a change was not something that was normal, not at all. Scaling the wall and going out that way was an option, but it was too risky, Lyle could be seen by someone who would report him to the soldiers. He, of course, wasn't planning on making himself suspicious right now. The first thing he needed to do was find a way to get out without being suspicious. The chance came rather quickly, however. A small dot-sized caravan was making its way to the gate. Three carriages, twenty guards, and two merchants were a part of the caravan. Lyle's mind spun. He could get out by using the caravan as a cover. He couldn't join them, that much was almost impossible at this moment since there was no way that they would allow a suspicious person that suddenly wanted to leave with them in the evening to join. Trying to sneak in would also be near dot impossible since the soldiers would definitely be checking the carriages before letting them leave. One idea that Lyle had was to go underneath the carriage and try to sneak out that way, but the problem was that if any of the soldiers was to check down, he would be caught right away. Think Lyle, think, what can I do to sneak together with the caravan? 
Lyle thought as he stared at the caravan that had neared the gate. He decided to first wait. He would wait for the soldiers to inspect the caravan and their guards before making his next move. To inspect everything should take a couple of minutes, and Lyle could use that time to try and sneak past everybody or get in a carriage. As the caravan arrived at the gate, the soldiers of course stopped them before making them get to the side. No sane person would dare deny the request of a royal soldier, and the caravan complied. The merchant that was seemingly leading the caravan talked with the soldiers and was giving them what seemed to be some sort of a bribe. Lyle's mind spun at the realization, the royal soldiers were quite loyal, and bribing them was not an easy task, one would usually need to fork out quite a hefty sum in order for them to look the other way. What the hell is inside that carriage? Lyle thought to himself as he stared at the main carriage that the merchant was pointing at for the soldiers. He quickly sprung to action, while the carriages were still moving in order to vacate the road for others who were leaving or entering, there were a couple of blind spots and Lyle was aiming to use them in order to get to the final carriage that would seemingly not be inspected as the two soldiers that were doing the search had accepted a small pouch from the merchant. Lyle knew that his timing had to be spot on, otherwise he might get caught. The guards that were guarding the carriages were mostly below the night realm, but there were three that were in the night realm with them. Those three were, however, put at the front, right around the main carriage and thus Lyle had a chance to sneak up on the others before moving to the main carriage. Lyle quickly took out his daggers and cut his hands before manipulating the blood to come out and form two small orbs of blood. He sped up and threw the two orbs next to two soldiers who were riding a horse each. One of the orbs fell on the right side, while the other fell on the left side. Upon hearing the sound of something hitting the ground, the soldiers looked to the right and left respectively, which left the center wide open for Lyle to pass through. Since both the soldiers had their backs turned to Lyle, they didn't notice him coming. The two looked down, but were unable to find anything on the ground, the orbs of blood that Lyle had thrown were small and the evening made it hard to spot the blood that was soaked into the ground, even during daytime it would be hard to spot it. Lyle was able to pass between the two guards when they looked to the side and before they averted their gaze from the ground, he had already slid in below the last carriage. That wasn't the end, as Lyle needed to get to the front before he would be safe. The carriage was about 40 centimeters, 1.3 feet, from the ground and Lyle had enough space to crawl through with ease. He quickly moved before stopping right at the end, he needed to pass through the horses before reaching the second carriage, if anyone was to spot him, he would be in a very bad position. He quickly observed his surroundings before suddenly coming from below the carriage and running past the horses that were surprised and alarmed by him. Before the two horses could neigh, Lyle had already disappeared below the second carriage. Luckily, he was fast enough to not be spotted or make the horses move around. The horses were well dot trained, as they needed to be if anyone was to use them to pass through a dangerous place, which this caravan was going to do it seemed like. Lyle did the same after reaching the end of the second carriage. The problem arose when the horses got alarmed by his appearance, and the fact that there was a knight inspecting the carriage that had his back turned to Lyle. Lyle quickly went down and slid between the man's legs as the knight turned around to look at the horses. Their neighs had hidden the sound of Lyle sliding and he was able to get under without being spotted. After some five minutes passed, the carriage started moving. Will I need to do this every single night? Lyle thought to himself as he was grabbing onto the carriage from underneath. I have to find a better way to get out, I can't be risking things every night. The whole situation was very lucky for Lyle. As he was a vampire lord, he was able to hide his presence and mana very well, that, coupled with the fact that he barely had any mana right now, made it very hard for anyone to notice Lyle, even the guards, and soldiers that were all much more powerful than the current him. Lyle was, however, very interested in what was inside the carriage. To make the merchant actually take out a bribe, one that was big enough for even the royal soldiers to take, the carriage definitely hid something very valuable inside of it. Lyle quickly took out his daggers before aiming at the carriage. Usually, a carriage that would transport valuable goods and have knights as entourage was protected by a formation and was built from high-dot-grade materials. 
This one, however, had none of that. For some reason, the merchant was focused on keeping secrecy and not drawing attention to himself or the goods. Whatever the reason for that might be, Lyle would find out soon enough. The daggers that Lyle used were quite powerful. They were crafted by a well-known blacksmith in Orsfold after Lyle had commissioned them. He had paid a hefty sum of 25,000 gold coins for the daggers. Even the mission he took this time would only pay him 20,000 gold coins for assassinating the young duke. The daggers were created by using a black metal that would absorb light so that there would be no shine from them. Both of the daggers had a serration, but it was on the back of the daggers while the edge was nice and sharp. The serrations would help when stabbing an enemy as they would tear apart the flesh and insides while pulling the insides out after Lyle pulled them out of the enemy. The daggers were new and Lyle had received them only last month. He had in total used them twice for a mission before, but other than that, they were brand new. Lyle stabbed the daggers inside the carriage and they penetrated through like it was nothing. There was not even a sound that was created from the daggers cutting inside the wood of the carriage. It wouldn't matter, however, as the sound of the horses galloping would pretty much mask any noise that Lyle would produce. He quickly started cutting away at the carriage before he was finally able to cut off a part that was wide enough for him to crawl in from. A problem, however, arose. As Lyle had finished cutting the wood, it suddenly fell down as something from above pushed it down. Lyle quickly acted and managed to grab the plank and the pouch that was above it, but he was now struggling with keeping his balance as he was only holding on to the carriage with his legs. Dot his abdominal muscles were tightened to their fullest as he slowly moved up before managing to put the pouch back inside and grab the underside of the carriage with his now free hand. He put the wooden plank inside as well before pulling himself up and entering the carriage. Chapter 22 Level 10 You are listening at Novel Full. Audio. The inside of the carriage was pitch dot black, but for Lyle that was no problem. The larger problem came from bumps on the road that the carriage would go over from time to time, which would make it shake a bit and almost make him lose his footing. Lyle checked out the inside of the carriage, there were multiple pouches that were neatly put on the side and a couple of crates. That was it, there was nothing else. Most of the carriage was empty, except for those items. But upon inspecting what was inside, Lyle stood in the carriage shocked. Gems, jewelry, weapons, armor. The inside of the carriage was full of such things, the wealth that was now put in front of Lyle was something that only nobles could possess. What the hell are these things doing here? Lyle shouted inside his mind as he stared at the weapons and armor in the carriage. Even though there were only enough armor pieces to equip ten men, all of them were of very high quality. Their red color and sleek design would bring the best out of anyone, in terms of looks at least. The defense they provided was great since they were made by a high-dot-ranking blacksmith that the duke had contacted. Yes, the armor pieces that were inside the carriage were from the private troops of the duke. Even though Lyle was able to easily kill the death soldiers inside the castle previously, it was mostly because they themselves were weak, too weak to possess such good armor. As for weapons, there were about twenty of them, all swords. The jewelry and gems were probably also from the castle. Thought Lyle before putting everything in his spatial ring and going back outside. I definitely can't let them see me now. Lyle thought as he looked around him. The caravan had actually gone inside the forest. Even though they were passing through the shallow part of the forest where they would face no enemy strong enough to truly threaten them, it was still weird as there were better paths to take. It doesn't matter, I can use this to my advantage and leave without being seen. Lyle thought before slowly moving to the edge of the carriage. As soon as the carriage passed next to some dense bushes that even got a bit entangled in the wheels of the carriage, Lyle jumped. The sound of the bushes did not alarm the guards or anyone else since they all knew that the path was narrow and that taking it would result in them hitting plants. Lyle's escape was not only successful but pretty much perfect. A couple of seconds had passed before Lyle got up and dusted himself off. He stared at the back of the caravan that was now far away and smiled. I can't believe I managed to do this. 
Lyle said to himself before slapping himself a bit to calm down his emotions. Dot let me get a bit further away before checking out my gains. Lyle thought before taking his leave. He only stopped after he had moved for about two minutes. Climbing on a tree, he leaned back against it as he sat on a big branch before checking the inside of his spatial ring. Just a brief scan of the items made his smile come back. All of this is worth more than 100,000 gold coins, hell, it might be worth 200,000. With this much, I can buy better gear and pay the organization for many things like someone to guard me, assassinate others, information. I'm only going to get paid 20,000 coins for killing the duke, but that was because he was an easy target and nobody thought that the archmage would be so powerful, plus it was a given that anything I found in the castle would be mine, which further lowered the payment. Lyle thought before smiling again. But this, this will be enough for a long time, Ilya himself had about 110,000 coins in the ring, after I find some good jewelry stores, I will be able to easily sell the jewelry and gems quickly. But for now, I need to get stronger. Lyle said as his face went back to his usual, deadpan self. Lyle brought out his gear and put it on. His black suit of armor was made of the leather of a demonic beast that was almost as powerful as a golden knight. There were metal pieces on the armor as well, they were sewn on and served to protect the vital areas of the body. Lyle's whole body was now covered in a suit of armor that clung tightly to his body but didn't impair his mobility at all. His two daggers were put on their small sheaths that were on his waist while Lyle also took out a couple of smaller items. Flash bombs that upon hitting the ground would not only explode and produce a bright light that would blind enemies for a couple of seconds but would also create a loud sound that would make their ears ring for quite some time. Smaller throwing knives were also included in Lyle's gear. The knives were about 7.5 centimeters, 3 inches, long and had no handles on them. Lyle would simply grab them with his fingers before throwing them at the enemies. Finally, there was also a spear. Lyle liked having a spear with him, it allowed him to possess means of a powerful long dot range attack as the daggers were too small to be able to deal with some enemies. Lyle checked his gear once again and after confirming that everything was fine, he took off and went deeper inside the forest, ready to begin hunting the monsters. A couple of hours later, Lyle was sitting atop a branch as he looked down on multiple bodies of dead monsters. The monsters had their bodies cut apart and their blood was spewed around everywhere in the area. That was because Lyle had used his ability in order to manipulate the blood. The stench of blood permeated through the forest as the many monsters smelt it. They moved closer to the origin of the smell, just like Lyle wanted them to. A couple of minutes before, just as Lyle had finished the battle against the humanoid monsters that were lying dead below him, he hit level 10. A notification appeared at that time. Player has reached level 10, please take on the trial challenge, the player will be unable to continue leveling up before taking the challenge, the class halls have been spawned in all bigger cities of the world and one can now access them in order to get a class after hitting level 10, ding. Class found, the player has already received a class thanks to his bloodline, ding. Player has gained a class and evolved to a stronger being, awarding stats. Strength plus 4, Agility plus 6, Endurance plus 3, Vitality plus 2, Willpower plus 3, Spirit plus 3, Name. Lyle Level. 10 to 310 slash 3000 Soul Power Class. Blood Lord, more info in the class menu, Race. True Vampire Lord, more info in the Race menu, Attribute Points. 0 Strength. 18 Agility. 21 Endurance. 13 Vitality. 13 Willpower. 13 Spirit. 16 Ding. The player has reached the first threshold with the Agility stat, new skill gained, Ding. Warning, a problem has arisen. Thanks to the player's bloodline, the system is unable to give out rewards for thresholds since the player has none at this moment. Please improve your strength in order to gain the benefits and bonuses from your bloodline, Lyle was a bit confused over what the system meant by thresholds and how he had none right now, but he didn't trouble himself much with all of that. 
He was surprised to see the large increase in stats after hitting level 10 as the bonus was more than what he had received from all the previous 10 levels before. That had given him an idea. He was now much more powerful than before and knew that he could deal with a large group of enemies. He used his ability to spread the blood around before climbing on a tree. The humanoid monsters he had killed were called the Ages. They resembled humans a lot, they walked on two legs and had two arms, a neck, and a head. The main difference was the size. Ages was at least two meters tall and their bodies were very thin and bony. They were monsters that didn't possess intelligence and liked to eat the organs of other beings. Their elongated necks and heads made them incredibly creepy, as did the smiles that were always plastered on their faces. They had no nose, ears no teeth. Their mouths were like the beak of a bird and they used that to tear off the flesh before swallowing organs whole. Lyle had previously killed a group of seven, but he knew that where there was a group of them, there were multiple other groups close by. The blood and spilled organs would attract the others as the ages were cannibals as well. Any fallen ages would have their corpse destroyed by their brethren as they tore the body apart in order to reach the organs. Chapter 23 Demon Boars You Are Listening at Novel Full. Audio. Sounds of the bushes being moved could be heard as monsters approached the area. It wasn't just ages that had appeared, but other monsters as well. The wolves of the forest had an excellent sense of smell that was further improved after the system arrived and the world's mana started going rampant. Toskers, demon boars, which although have demon in their name, are not truly demonic creatures. Their appearance was demonic as they had spikes growing out of their back and their blood. Red head was enough to spook any new adventurer that came to the forest. Their tusks were about 20 centimeters, 8 inches, long and curved down next to the mouth. The interesting thing about the tusks was that they couldn't stab with them, they actually used them as blades as the forward part of the tusks was incredibly sharp. They ate meat and only meat. Their mouths were full of incredibly sharp teeth that could rip apart flesh with ease and were considered to be some of the most dangerous beasts inside the forest. From what Lyle was able to see, the demon boars were definitely more powerful than the other monsters at this moment. Dot as soon as the monsters laid eyes on one another, they started attacking. The forest floor was a mess, the monsters tore apart one another as Lyle simply looked at them from above. He wasn't going to join the battle, at least not yet. He held his throwing knives as he used them to pick off any monsters that were close to dying in order to get more soul power, but that was all he did so far. There were simply too many monsters present and he would get torn apart by them if he went down. The ages were powerful and could crush a normal human easily with their bare hands, but they were slow and clumsy, which made it relatively easy for even normal humans to escape from them when in the forest. The Toskers were even worse their numbers down had thinned and were almost completely killed by the other monsters. The wolves were fast, deadly, and cunning, which made them one of the apex predators of the forest. The demon boars, however, were simply powerful. Their thick hide and large size made it almost impossible to stop their charge. They were also quite swift and attacking them from the side or back would not give the best results. The spikes they had on their backs not only defended them against attacks but were also another means of attacking the enemy after charging at them. Lyle waited for about six minutes before the number of monsters went down. He took out his spear and infused mana into his right hand before pulling it back and throwing his spear with full force at a boar. The spear flew through the air and penetrated deep inside the already wounded boar. It had previously scrapped against two wolves before running into an Aegis that had managed to grab its body before attempting to squish it to death. The spikes had saved the boar as they penetrated through the monster's hand and forced it to let go of the boar. Now it was dead, the spear had penetrated right above its head and dealt the final blow. Lyle nodded to himself before jumping down at an Aegis that was currently holding a wolf that had tried to jump on top of it and bite its neck. Lyle quickly stabbed down at the shoulders of the Aegis before pulling out the dagger that was being held by his right hand and stabbing the Aegis's neck from the side. He didn't stop, his right hand continued moving as he opened up the neck and a fountain of blood started flowing out. 
The ages let go of the wolf and tried to hold his neck, but the result would still stay the same. Lyle jumped off from the back of the ages and slashed at its eye before falling down on the wolf the monster had let go and stabbed down at it. Lyle's daggers were incredibly sharp and penetrated through the fur of the wolf with ease. He quickly pulled his hands back as the daggers cut open two large cuts on the wolf's stomach. Intestines could be seen coming out from the body as the wolf yelped in pain. Lyle simply stabbed it in the eye before jumping back and dodging a charge from another demon boar. The boar continued forward and hit the wolf, the tusks immediately cut deep inside the body of the already dead wolf before the boar lifted it with his head and threw it back. The body was almost cut in half from the boar's actions and fell about one meter in front of Lyle who was running at another ages that was squeezing two toskers in his hands. He quickly threw his daggers at the two small monsters. Thud. Thud. The daggers stabbed deeply through the heads of the monsters as Lyle jumped up and pulled them out before stabbing the ages in its eyes. The monster screamed out in pain and let go of the dead Toskers before trying to catch Lyle in a bear hug and crash his body. Lyle was ready for it, however. He had stabbed the daggers so that the serrated parts were facing down. With that, he was able to get a good grip on the eye sockets and use the daggers in order to pull himself up and get above the head of the ages that was now bent over. The daggers had been pulled out and Lyle quickly stabbed at the neck. He could have stabbed the head, but he wasn't sure whether he had enough strength to actually penetrate through the thick skull of the ages and therefore he opted for the easier, more certain way of killing it. By the time the ages had fallen down, the demon boar had killed another two wolves and it was only it and Lyle that was left alive. The boar had some wounds on its body, but they weren't anything serious while Lyle was completely unharmed. He had managed to kill all of his enemies without sustaining damage and was actually quite proud of himself for doing so. He stared at the boar as it charged at him with the tusks pointing straight at his body. The boar was about 1.3 meters, 4.25 feet, tall and the soil beneath its feet were getting thrown around from the sheer power it had during the charge. Lyle knew that he would be unable to stop the charge of the monster. His equipment was great but he was unable to use it to its fullest as he was simply far too weak at this moment. He sidestepped in order to dodge the charge before running toward the body of the boar he had killed with the spear. He needed it. Even though his daggers were sharp enough to even cut through the spikes on the boar's back and perhaps even the tusks, he would be unable to do it since his body was much, much weaker now. With the spear, however, he would have more options. The best way of fighting an enemy like the boar was to have a weapon that would allow you to have a good reach distance. His daggers were simply too short to present him with such an advantage, but the spear would be more than enough. The boar was, however, faster than him and he needed to jump to the side twice in order to dodge the attacks. One of the attacks had managed to graze his leg, and even though he had a leather of a powerful monster equipped, the power beneath that simple graze was enough to give him quite some pain. The thing with better equipment was the fact that they needed mana in order to be used to their fullest. Without having sufficient mana to activate the equipment, they were simply a bit better than average ones. The armor for one, without being infused with mana, would not have even a third of its normal defensive properties. The same went for the weapons and any other items he had. Lyle could use mana and infuse it into the items, but he now had simply way too low of a mana capacity, and doing it once would make his mana reserve go down. Lyle sprinted and grabbed the spear before turning around and widening his eyes. The boar was right in front of him. Dodging at this moment was impossible, there was simply not enough time left. Lyle planted the spear in front of him and aimed it at the boar, hoping for the best possible ending. The spear went through the head, but it also dug deeper and deeper inside the soil. The momentum of the boar carried over even after its death and soon it collided with Lyle. The sharp tusks dug deeply into the armor as the boar fell down on him. The heavy body of the boar almost squished him as he struggled to push it to the side and free himself. Such a battle would probably make the other monsters second dot guess whether they wished to come here or not, but the intense stench of blood would still make some too curious. 
he needed to take his knives back and get the hell out of there before more monsters arrived. Chapter 24 System Limits and the Midnight Dagger You are listening at NovelFull.audio The night was still young, at least for Lyle who only planned on returning to the city in the morning. He guessed that he had about 2.5 hours before he would need to go back to the city in order to return at the right time so that he could get back in his room without being seen by the staff or other guests. The inn he was staying at right now was located at an even better spot compared to the previous one that he chose without thinking too much as he didn't plan on staying long in the city anyway. There were other buildings, alleys, and trees around the inn, which made it incredibly easy for Lyle to sneak in and out of his room. He took a short break atop another tree. The sound of monsters growling and fighting each other reverberated through the forest as, just as he had guessed, they had arrived at where the battle between him and the other monsters happened and was starting to slaughter one another. One thing surprised Lyle as he had managed to get about 200 meters away from the area as the system notification hit one more time. Ding! The battle has been concluded collecting soul power. LVL5 Tosker killed, 25 soul power gained. LVL4 Tosker killed, 20 soul power gained. LVL5 Tosker killed, 25 soul power gained. LVL12 Ages killed, 250 soul power gained. LVL11 Ages killed, 200 soul power gained. LVL14 Demon Boar killed, 350 soul power gained. LVL15 Demon Boar killed. 400 soul power gained. LVL9 wolf killed, 90 exp gained. Rank E iron dagger acquired. Rank E rough leather boots acquired, due to the host being 5 levels above some monsters, the soul power has been halved, if the host is 10 levels higher than a monster, he will not receive any soul power. The host has earned 1 520 soul power and 14 s coins, Soul coins or S coins for short are the currency upon which the system and most organizations in the galaxy operate, unlocking more functions of the system will cost the host and the other hosts of the planet S coins and contributions which can be earned by slaying monsters, leveling up, completing certain quests or challenges that the system gives and more. Buying items from the system, initiating contact with beings outside of the planet, having any craftsman outside of the planet make items for you, and using the services of buildings and organizations that have spawned on the planet will all need S coins. Finding out that there was a currency that the system used and that it was used outside of their planet was a big shock to Lyle. He had already had thoughts that life outside of the planet existed, hell, it was almost certain as the top powers of the planet had already managed to find planets that had mana on them. They were even close to creating portals that would lead them there, but Lyle was unaware if they were successful with that or not. Lo another finding was that any enemy that was 5 levels below Lyle would give only 50% of the soul power and that 10 levels lower meant no soul power at all. It made sense since weaker people could simply stay in the safer areas and hunt monsters to level up, and more powerful beings that could level an entire city with their spells and attacks could increase their soul power very quickly if such a limit didn't exist. Lyle didn't really care for it, as an assassin he was used to killing people that were stronger than him and didn't have a wide repertoire of skills that could be used on multiple opponents, making the limits not really unfavorable to him. They would certainly crush the dreams of many, however. The existence of items being suddenly spawned after a battle was another thing that surprised him. Since he couldn't see anything that the system mentioned, he had even gone back a bit in order to check if the boots and dagger were in the place he had previously fought the monsters, and his thoughts were correct. He could see a simple dagger and rough boots that farmers would usually wear on the ground. He didn't really care for them as the gear he had on was much better so he simply left. Still, knowing that he could actually get gear just from fighting monsters was an incredible thing. He had no idea what the rank was and how many there were, but he guessed that he would learn in the future. That was before the system had seemingly read his thoughts and answered. The ranking for abilities and items goes from F to Z, with the full ranking being F, D, e, D, C, B, A, S, 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 Z, while simply nodded his head, grateful to know the rankings. He was now aware that his ability to control blood was not a normal one at all, 
as it was ranked at S, which was on the higher end of the spectrum. After dealing with all of that, Lyle stood up from the branch before heading deeper inside the forest. Since weaker enemies now barely gave him any soul power, he needed to go and fight those that were at least level 10, otherwise gaining levels would take too long. He ran through the forest at full speed, alerting a couple of monsters that were nearby. He could hear the monsters charging and running after him, but instead of feeling intimidated or concerned, he simply smirked before continuing to run. After some time, Lyle suddenly sped up before jumping on a tree and going back. The monsters who were suddenly left without a target were confused. They all looked around, only finding other monsters that had been charging at Lyle with them. The monsters were quickly alarmed and started growling at each other, but not attacking. The more powerful monsters had some intelligence and wouldn't simply jump to battle right away. But Lyle was, of course, aware of that. He grabbed two of his throwing knives before throwing them at two groups of monsters. There were five groups in total, and upon being injured, the monsters that belonged to the two groups that Lyle had targeted stared at the others in fury before attacking. Even though they had some basic intelligence, it was still not even close to a human's. The monsters started a bloodbath while Lyle observed from above. He waited until the number of monsters had thinned down and they were injured before dropping down with his spear and killing one. He used the same tactic as before. Instead of simply charging in and fighting a group by himself, Lyle could manipulate the monsters to fight against each other and tire themselves out before interrupting the fight and claiming the benefits. His spear punctured the bodies of the monsters easily, and even though Lyle was not that proficient with the spear, he was still better compared to an average spearman. He only used it for a bit before throwing the spear at a monster and quickly drawing out his daggers. So far, Lyle was too weak to even try using any of the skills that he had created or learned from the organization. There were some that he used, but they were more movements and subtle twists and turns of the body, legs, and arms than real skills as those were usually learned when one was close to reaching the realm of night. That was how it was done in the organization, however, other organizations had different methods of teaching. The organization that Lyle was a part of, the Midnight Dagger, operated differently from others. They believed that the fundamentals should be practiced till perfection before an assassin should start learning and creating skills of their own. Movement, throwing skills, close dot quarter combat, stealth, and anything one could do in order to help become a better assassin was learned in the beginning. That was why in the early stages, the new recruits of the Midnight Dagger were weaker compared to most organizations, but after the recruits matured, they were above most, especially when reaching tier 2 and higher. Lyle was using all that he had learned back then in every single battle. He didn't even think about it, he just did it as it was a part of his daily life at this point. But the skills would only be available later as Lyle would definitely suffer from exhausting his mana if he tried to use any now. Lyle flickered around the area as he battled against the monsters and used the surroundings to his advantage. Many times would the monster charge at him, only to be met with a tree, rock, or another monster when Lyle dodged. He picked them apart methodically and barely suffered a scratch from the battle. His stamina was a different story, however, as he was slowly starting to get tired. Chapter 25 Bonus Chapter Kilman you are listening at novelfull.audio. Phew, that should be enough for today, Lyle said as he exhaled deeply. Tens of bodies were piled up around him, there were eye jars, demon boars, gnolls, kobolds, and even hobgoblins. Finding gnolls and kobolds was a surprise for Lyle as they were usually much deeper inside the forest. Most of the time, the two monster races stuck to being closer to the mountain that was further away and rarely ever ventured close to cities or villages. Kobolds and gnolls possessed higher intelligence than most monsters at their level and would usually keep to themselves as they feared the fierce retaliation that humans would give after they would destroy a village. Seeing them this close meant one of two things. They were chased out from the mountain and had no other option but to come here, or more of them had appeared and they were now spreading around because they needed more resources. The hobgoblins were what made Lyle truly worried. If there were already hobgoblins that led goblins here, 
then it wouldn't take long for more powerful variants to appear. Ogres were one of those variants. They were incredibly powerful monsters that could crush enemies of the same level thanks to their incredible physical strength, but their intelligence was lower compared to hobgoblins and goblins of the same level, which made setting up traps to target them easier. Hobgoblins and goblins also had other forms they could take after becoming more powerful. Goblin warriors and sling shooters were two of the most common ones, but there were also shamans, alchemists, and more. Those were the ones that were harder to deal with since they used magic and the weakness of their fleshly bodies would be negated. Hobgoblins could also become warriors, swordsmen, archers, shamans, alchemists, brawlers, juggernauts, and more. They would become harder and harder to deal with if the empire didn't respond quickly, but judging by how fast things had changed in the forest, while doubted that the other regions of the empire had stayed peaceful. It was just like the system had said in the beginning, the world was going through a change, and humans and other intelligent species would have to struggle again in order to survive the new dangers that would show up. Lyle made up his mind to tell the guards about what he had found, but he would of course first disguise himself as another person. Dot simply telling them that he had seen all of these monsters made no sense, so he cut off the heads of some gnolls, kobolds, and hobgoblins in order to persuade them. After doing so, Lyle made his way back to the city. He disguised himself as a middle dot aged man that wore a ponytail and an eye patch. Multiple scars could be seen on his face and the bare chest was visible thanks to the robe he was now wearing. The robe wasn't just a normal robe, well, it was, but what it represented was far from ordinary. Lyle was wearing a robe that was called the Kai. The Kai was a robe that one could buy almost everywhere in the world and the people that wore it was called Kilman. The Kilman belonged to no empire or kingdom, but a clan of warriors that one could join simply by showing his worth and strength. The one that led the clan was one of the most powerful people below the world's strongest five and was well dot respected by many thanks to his great power and young age. Kiman. It was a name, but also a title that was given to the leader of the Kilman. Being only 50 years old, the current Kiman was a talent that would only be seen once every 1000 years on the planet. He had risen in power quickly and many believed that soon he would break through to the next realm and that the strongest five would now have a sixth member amongst them. The Kilman didn't like wearing armor. They disliked using any tricks either. They were warriors and they fought in a pure and simple manner. The robe that they wore was easy to identify since there were six different weapons painted on its back, the symbol of the Kilman. They would only use their weapon and that was it. Their robe offered barely any protection, but they didn't need it as the Kilmen that were higher up in the hierarchy were all veteran fighters that could dust the floor with a normal opponent that was of their level. Impersonating a Kilmen was a serious offense, but simply wearing the robes wasn't. There were many that would buy the robes simply to walk around and show off, but some of those would face a terrible future as there were many underground organizations that held a grudge against the Kilmen and would attack them on sight. Even some kingdoms and empires had banned the Kilmen from entering and the robes banned from being sold. Still, there were those that would simply buy the robes and, in an attempt to look powerful and dangerous, would disappear. Wearing the robe of a Kilmen was something that Lyle occasionally did as they were quite well dot respected in the Golden Lion Empire. Partly it was because of how powerful the upper echelons of the Kilmen were, while another part was because the protector of the realm, the most powerful being in the empire had once been a Kilman before he hung the robe and retired from the life. Being caught impersonating a Kilman was thus even worse here. Lyle was well dot versed in acting as a Kilman, but he was a bit nervous. He would need to face the royal soldiers and make them believe that he was a Kilman himself, but without his previous power and the lack of mana, he wouldn't be able to pressure them with his aura or anything like that. His killing intent was the only thing he had left. He had honed his killing intent so that none would leak when he would go for the killing blow during an assassination attempt, but one other thing he could do was what he had done when facing the duke previously. He could suddenly erupt with a dense and powerful killing intent that would shake the very core of beings that were in front of him. That would be the only way Lyle could get the soldiers to believe he truly was a killman, if that failed, however, 
he would either need to flee from the spot or reveal his true identity in order to avoid being arrested or even killed by the soldiers. Lyle had now arrived near the city, upon walking to the gate, the soldiers had already noticed him. The robe, coupled with Lyle's face and mannerisms made them a bit tense. A killman arriving in the city was quite weird as they were mostly found in areas where the monsters were high in density and were more powerful. His appearance and the invisible pressure that formed around him made the soldiers turn serious as they could immediately identify that the person in front of them was not someone to be trifled with. Upon seeing their countenance, Lyle was surprised a bit. He was only leaking a small portion of his killing intent, but the effect was obviously much greater than he anticipated. S. State your reason for coming here, Kilman. One of the soldiers said as he stared at Lyle. I was merely passing by, but a troublesome sight had shown itself to my eyes, I merely come here to warn you and to investigate further for a couple of days, Lyle said in a serious tone as he suddenly took out the heads from his spatial ring. Seeing the heads of kobolds, gnolls, and hobgoblins falling down on the ground made the soldiers confused at first, while the onlookers stared in horror at the bloody sight. They were a couple of kilometers away from the mountain, you know what that means, right? Lyle asked the guards who suddenly widened their eyes in shock. The monsters have started moving, it seems that the words we all heard two days ago did not lie, the world is changing, and we need to follow it, otherwise it could spell our doom, Lyle said before making a brief pause and continuing. You should bring this to the Duke, and alert him of the changes, I will be staying here for a couple of days, investigating what is happening in the forest, Lyle said before walking through the open gate. W. Wait, sir, the Duke, he, he is dead. A soldier suddenly spoke from behind Lyle. Lyle turned around and stared at the soldier before opening his mouth. What happened? An assassin appeared, he killed the Duke right before the so. called system appeared, we came to investigate his death, I will bring this to the commander, will you join us? As if. Lyle thought in his head before speaking. No, as I have stated before, I am merely passing by, I only wish to investigate the forest for a couple of days, I will not bother the commander or you, I bide you farewell now, the journey has been long and I wish to rest before starting my investigation, Lyle said before turning around and disappearing around the corner, leaving the soldiers dumbfounded as they stared at the heads. Go to the commander, he needs to know about this. One of the soldiers said as the one closest to the heads nodded before picking them up and speeding to the castle. Chapter 26 The Commander's Offer You Are Listening at Novel Full. Audio. Chapter 26 The Commander's Offer on top of the castle, in a study that belonged to the old duke, the commander of the company of soldiers sat, a big table was placed in front of him, and on it, tens of documents that he needed to go through. The documents presented all the wrongdoings of the young duke, the archmage, and other ministers of the territory. The study was actually the highest place in the castle, but after the death of the old duke, it was locked and nobody was allowed to enter. That was under the orders of the young duke Orsted. The commander had opened the study, and upon seeing that nothing was out of place, he used it to go through the documents. The portrait of the old duke and his family was hung on the left wall while the right was filled with bookshelves. Documents that the old duke was going through before his death were still there. The difference between reports the old duke had gotten and the ones that were in front of the commander were very, very different. The situation was worse than expected. Almost all of the noble houses here were guilty of numerous charges and if charged with all of the evidence that the commander had, most would lose their titles, while some would even be beheaded. That was what the commander planned on doing, he had no sympathy for those bastards that sat around and did nothing but collect money from their business while occasionally going out to cause trouble. Beheading was a mercy to those bastards, but he was not the lawmaker, and neither could he try to change the rules. He knew that even after he would present the evidence to the royal court, some of it would definitely get misplaced and lost. There were always deals happening in the shadows, deals that he was not privy to because of his position. Still, even those that would survive and perhaps face no consequences would still pay a price. Most would become the dogs of the empire, 
doing anything and everything that the empire needed of them. They would never have as much freedom as before and would spend their whole lives serving the crown without any means of rebelling. For some, such a thing was too disgraceful, the disgrace they would feel would eat them away until they made a blunder. When they did so, then it would be time for them to face the consequences that they had managed to escape from so long ago. The commander sighed, even after two days he was still not close to dealing with everything here. With the situation of the entire world changing, he didn't even know what to do. He had contacted his superiors, but the only response he got was one that told him to continue with the original plan until they updated him with more information. Suddenly loud knocks could be heard on the door of the study. The commander raised an eyebrow before opening his mouth. Enter. His calm voice reverberated through the study as the door opened and the royal soldier from the gate entered the room. Sir, we might have a problem. The soldier said before showing the heads of the dead monsters. He had put them in special bags so that blood or brain matter wouldn't drip down. Even after his death, the old duke was still one of the most respected people in the empire, the soldier wouldn't dare to sully his study with blood. Upon seeing the slight confusion on the commander's face, the soldier quickly narrated what had happened. He told about the killmen that had suddenly appeared and given them the heads while reporting that the monsters were moving. Upon hearing everything, the commander simply sighed before getting up and looking through the window. The world is changing, the situation of the dukedom is far worse than anticipated, the assassin that was supposed to send the signal never showed up, even though he had done his mission, and now a mysterious stranger, a killman, shows up. The commander scratched the back of his head before sitting down. Can't I get a break? The commander said as he stared at the ceiling before looking at the soldier. We currently don't have nearly enough manpower to do a sweep of the forest, from your guess, what realm is this killman at? The commander said before suddenly letting out mana and pressuring the soldier. The pressure only lasted for a couple of seconds before the commander stopped and looked at the soldier who was now sweating a bit. Even though the soldier was a knight, when put up against a golden knight, he was barely able to stand from the slight mana that the commander leaked. He never leaked mana, but the pressure he gave off simply by looking at us made it clear that he was above us, so I would say at least a high dot level silver knight, or perhaps a golden knight. I see. The commander said as he nodded. He said that he will stay a couple of days in order to investigate the forest. Yes sir. Good, give his description to all the soldiers, including the ones from the dukedom, he is not to be disturbed by anybody, all we ask of him is to share his findings with us, if he needs help, he has the right to choose two royal soldiers of the Silver Knight realm to help him, resources as well. The commander said as the soldier stared at him with wide dot open eyes. Sir, that, I might be presumptuous to say, but isn't that a bit too much? No, it isn't presumptuous, it is too much, but it's also a bet. A bet, sir. Yes, if the Kilman manages to find out more information and give it to us, we will be the ones to profit, he knew that, that was why he had given you the heads and the information so easily, but I doubt he will ask of help, the Kilman like working alone best, he probably won't ask for any resources either. The commander said before looking at the soldier. Go, I want everybody to be aware of that man's existence by sundown. Yes sir. The soldier said before bowing and going out of the study. A killman, hmm. The commander mused to himself before taking another document to go over. As for the person they were discussing. He was currently sitting in the room and having a discussion with the system. Dot, the host's bloodline will have an impact on other people, as long as the person in question isn't two tiers above you, they will feel a sense of suppression coming from you, those that are two tiers above the host or more will, however, see through it. So, the reason why me releasing a bit of killing intent was able to make those soldiers nervous was because of my bloodline huh? Lyle thought out loud as he stared out the window of his room. Knowing something like this would be very useful. He could now easily bluff and act powerful when faced with those that are stronger than him, of course, he doubted that it would work on everybody. Correct, as the host becomes more powerful, 
the effect of the bloodline will become more powerful as well, but there would of course be those that also have a powerful bloodline or special abilities that will allow them to see through the host. I see, that's good to know, I probably shouldn't try to use it in crowded places then, I don't want anyone to find out about my bloodline just yet, Lal said before lying down on the bed. I still haven't used the, servitude, skill, I wonder what kind of creature I should try and use this on, a hobgoblin, maybe a wolf. Lyle thought before shaking his head. He would try to use the skill when the opportunity arose, he only had one slot for a servant, and he wasn't going to use it for some weakling. The opportunity would, however, come sooner than Lyle had expected. As he got up from the bed, Lyle put on the robe of a killman before disguising himself once again. He used the same appearance he had in the morning and went to the city gate. Upon reaching the gate, the soldiers simply nodded at him while one called him over. He explained that the commander would like to work together with Lyle and the terms he had given. Upon seeing the terms, Lyle smiled inside but simply shook his head whilst telling the guard that he will give them information about the forest for free and that there was no need to give him any benefits for something like that. The commander is a shrewd one, had I accepted the offer, I would have probably been captured by him and the Silver Knights of the company in the morning, he definitely knows that no killman would take such an offer as they disliked getting help for such simple matters. Lyle thought as he made his way into the forest. Upon hearing the report from the soldier that was at the gate, the commander simply nodded before excusing the soldier, he glanced at the window, smiled, and went back to reading the documents in front of him. Chapter 27 Harrison you are listening at novelfull.audio. Now, where shall I go first? Lyle thought as he stood in the forest. The forest that was close to the city was in no way a small one. It encapsulated a large area of the dukedom and the deeper one went, the more powerful monsters they would encounter. It wasn't as if the old duke couldn't have destroyed the monsters of the forest back when he was alive, but he decided to simply keep the part that was close to the city empty while letting the monsters that were deeper inside live. They were good enemies for his soldiers to fight against and they also allowed the adventurers guild to have a place nearby where they could train their newbies and those that were more powerful. From what Lyle knew, the most powerful monsters inside the forest were mere bronze night realm monsters, such enemies would have been a piece of cake for him in the past, not to mention the powerful old duke who was a peak golden knight before his death. Destroying every monster inside the forest would have been nothing for that man, so him leaving them alive in order to train his troops was definitely true. But who knew, maybe there were some other, more interesting things to find inside the forest. It had changed since the system had arrived. It wasn't that obvious in the last couple of days, but the trees had grown a bit and the bark was tougher. It was hard to notice in the parts close to the city, but as Lyle went in deeper, he was able to notice the slight changes. He had spent the last two days fighting in the forest and was able to see the slight changes that had taken place. As Lyle passed through the forest and headed into the deeper areas, he had come across more monsters than usual. The suppression his bloodline had was, unfortunately not able to affect the monsters. Even though the suppression came from his bloodline and should affect all races, the monsters were simply not bothered by it. They would still, however, feel a threat from Lyle and would mostly keep out of his way. Lyle planned on going deeper than ever this time, he wanted to see just how the situation deeper inside the forest was before informing the soldiers that stood guard at the city gate. Hundreds of kilometers away from the city, however, the caravan that Lyle had robed had arrived at their location and entered a city that was a bit smaller compared to the one Lyle was in. The caravan guards escorted it to a large mansion before stopping in front of the gate of the mansion and waiting outside for the merchant to come out. The tier 1 guards that had traveled with them went inside as they were originally members of the mansion and were just sent to make sure the merchant and the goods were safe. The lord of the mansion was another duke but the one that had sent the merchant and the guards were the third son of the duke, Harrison. The third son was the one that held the least power in his family, he was the fifth child, and even his two older sisters had more influence compared to him. In the past, the young boy was good friends with Orsted, the only son of the old duke that later became a duke himself. 
Orsted was similar to the boy in regards to not being very talented and it came to fighting or magic but had a scheming mind. The two were once good friends as their fathers were close as well. Orsted disliked the older siblings of the young boy and didn't bother with them, but the two, however, became quite close. Harrison and Orsted would regularly hang out and talk, making up crazy plans that they would one day try to fulfill in order to raise through the ranks and reach heights that even their own fathers were unable to reach. They both knew that it was impossible for them to do so, but nothing stopped them from daydreaming at least. When the old duke was assassinated, Harrison was one of the first people to go to Orsted in order to check up on him and help him out. He could see that the old friend he once had changed, but Harris' son didn't know just how much he had changed. After spending two days with Orsted, Harrison got into a big argument with him, many things were said and Harrison was forced to leave as Orsted even threatened to get his guards to break his legs and throw him outside. Orsted also attacked Harrison where he was the most sensitive, calling him a useless piece of garbage that would never be able to amount to anything, a waste of space that, once one of his siblings managed to inherit his father's position, would get shunned to the side and left to live a life of an average person. The words hit Harrison deeply and he never spoke to Orsted after that day. One thing he did, however, was plant spies. He had heard how Orsted was not loved by the people of the city a while back and decided to investigate. Harrison himself hid a deep secret. He never truly cared for the title of the duke. He never wished to really inherit his father's position and lead the family. He wanted to stay unknown and just live a life of a rich person without having all the responsibility that came with it. For that to happen, however, he needed to have power as he would lose everything after his siblings took over. Dot he put spies not only at Orsted but on multiple other people as well. He had created a spy organization that nobody knew of as they only served him. They weren't particularly good, but there were three that were a cut above the rest. The three came from a different empire and were struggling to survive when Harasan took them in as his servants back when he was a kid. The three owed their lives to Harrison and vowed to serve him until their deaths. They trained hard and became quite strong and well dot respected amongst the staff. It was they who gave Harrison the idea to make a spy organization and start collecting dirt on influential people in order to have more chips in the future. He always had a couple of his men in Orsted's castle, and upon the assassination of the Duke, they acted quickly. They went to the storeroom and picked up as much equipment as they could while another group took the jewels. They didn't have time to think about getting more and left the castle fairly quickly with all the items. They laid low for a day with the merchant who was also a member of the organization before leaving the city. The merchant didn't only bribe the soldiers back when Lyle had seen him, but he also showed a small sigil that made the soldiers know that he worked for a noble family. That was the reason why the soldiers never checked the carriage, and why Lyle was able to rob them. In their haste, they simply didn't have time to get a spatial ring to transport everything that way. As the merchant arrived deeper into the mansion, he and the guards entered a small storage room before getting off the carriage. Harrison was waiting for them with some other servants. The three head spies were of course there with him, each of them was a tier 2 combatant and a simple glance of theirs made the merchant tremble a bit. You have arrived, did you come across any issues along the way? Harrison asked the merchant who simply shook his head. No sir, everything went well, I that I have to say, to, to meet your esteemed self, I am very honored. The merchant said as he bowed down to Harrison who came in front of him. Good, it's good that no problems arose, Harrison said as he brought the merchant up and patted his shoulder. Now we only need to get rid of any evidence of our involvement, Harrison said as he looked at the merchant whose eyes had opened wide in shock. A dagger had penetrated his chest and heart. Harrison stared at the merchant with cold eyes before twisting the dagger and pulling it out. The merchant fell down on the ground lifelessly, his eyes still showing shock at what had happened. This was supposed to be the day he would rise up through the ranks of the organization. He had done a very important task without any hiccups and was expected to be rewarded greatly. Instead, he was killed. It wasn't only him, however. The guards that came with the caravan were all dead. 
The three behind Harrison had previously gone out and made short work of the guards who had still not reached even tier one before coming back to him. The son of the merchant stared at his father's lifeless body in shock before staring at Hara's son. His father had brought him together for this mission as he believed that his son could perhaps rise even higher in ranks than him after getting to know the boss and other higher dot ups. A guard came behind the boy and slit his throat. The boy quickly bled out and died before his body was dragged somewhere together with his father's body. His mother had died a long time ago and it was only he and his father in the family, their disappearance would probably go unnoticed. Harrison nodded to the guards as he stood behind the carriage doors. Finally, to think I got a chance to get something this valuable right now, my luck truly is too good. Harrison thought as the door opened, leaving his face confused as he stared at the empty carriage and the hole that was made in the bottom of it. Chapter 28 Harrison's Plans You Are Listening at Novel Full. Audio. Chapter 28 Harrison's Plans, Huh? Harrison stared at the empty carriage before looking at one of the three Tier 1 guards that had been together with the merchant. The guard had the same reaction as Harrison, only one much stronger. He and the others were the ones in charge of protecting the caravan, especially the last carriage that held the important items inside. He and the others never even checked the carriage as they were hurrying to Harrison and didn't want any delays. Nothing had happened during the trip and there was never a moment where the carriage was left alone as there was always at least one of them right next to it. They had been attacked by small groups of monsters and bandits along the way, but a simple show of strength was usually enough to make them flee, as for those that didn't. Their lifeless bodies were left to rot on the road. The guards were all panicking now, they knew that the items they were transporting were incredibly valuable to their lord, and they were not here. Where? The hell? Are my goods? Dot the guards shook in fear as Harrison's enraged face appeared before them. His eyes were bloodshot and he was red in the face as he stared at them with hostility. M.M.Y. Lord, we don't know, everything went well, we really have no idea what happened. One of the guards said as he bowed down to Harrison who was still furious. Today was supposed to be the day when he would take the first step at creating his personal forces, the armor and weapons that he was supposed to receive were top dot quality goods that one wouldn't be able to get just by using money. The armor pieces and the weapons that Orsted had ordered to be made were made by a very respected blacksmith, even if Harrison had the money to order something like that, he would need to wait incredibly long as his status was below many that the blacksmith took orders from. It was thanks to Orsted being a duke and the fresh memory of his father that made the blacksmith put his order a top priority. Everyone believed that Orsted was having them done at that time to increase the strength of his troops in order to fight against the enemy that took his father away. The weapons and armor that Harrison's men had stolen were very valuable and were supposed to be used to arm the strongest among his followers. He planned on making some slight changes to them so that people wouldn't recognize them before he would give it to them. But now, all of that was gone. Harrison didn't care that much for the jewelry and gems that were missing as those were only secondary, but the weapons and armor were things he needed right now. He climbed inside the carriage and looked around, as did his three personal servants. They did a quick inspection before coming to the same conclusion. Somebody went below, hung from the carriage, and cut off a piece of it before sneaking in and stealing everything. You idiots! Harrison bellowed as he struck one of the Tier 1 guards. How did somebody manage to sneak in and steal the goods right under your noses? The guards were now terrified. They messed up, they truly messed up. They knew that Harrison would definitely not let them off the hook. Suddenly the three all acted. The one that Harrison had struck went to grab him as he was aware that the only way to survive today would be to take the young lord hostage and leave the city. The other two all positioned themselves next to the guard in order to stop the three tier two fighters, but before the main guard could even grab Harrison, a hand grabbed his wrist before applying pressure and almost breaking it. One of Harrison's personal servants, Jonah appeared in front of Harrison and shielded him from harm. The other two acted quickly as well, before the guards had been able to position themselves properly, they were already face. 
to dot face with Elena and Ian, the other two personal servants of Harrison. Ian and Elena struck the two heavy and in a matter of seconds, the battle was over as the two guards were lying on the ground, their arms broken. Jonah didn't spare the guard in front of him, he snapped his wrist before using his finger to poke and destroy one of the guard's eyes. He then quickly bent down and grabbed the guard's leg before sweeping him off the ground and breaking the leg. He then proceeded to stomp and smash the other hand of the guard completely. The guard screamed in agony, as did the other two. Harrison on the other hand looked unbothered as he neared the incapacitated guard. You have failed me, I know that you thought you could escape by capturing me, but now you will find out what happens to those that not only fail me but also threaten my life. Harrison glanced at the three who quickly nodded to him before grabbing the guards and throwing them out, allowing a couple of people to pick them up and bring them somewhere. You will soon be begging for death, Harrison said as he stared at the three guards who were soon gone from his sight. What shall we do, my lord? Elena asked as Harrison sat on the carriage and sighed deeply. Nothing, whoever did this was good, they not only snuck past the three guards but were able to take everything quickly and disappear without causing an alarm, it was probably a tier 2 or tier 3 combatant, probably an assassin or thief, Harrison said with a heavy face as he looked back at the carriage. The weapons and armor were supposed to be his trump card in the fight against his siblings, even though they commanded great respect amongst his father's troops and servants, even they would have great trouble getting such good items. The armor and weapons that Orsted had ordered were good enough for golden knights to use, they were rare and hard to come by, even Orsted had only gotten about fifty of them after using an incredible amount of wealth. Of course, compared to the equipment that Golden Knights used, such mass-dot-produced items were barely enough, but for Harrison, they would be a godsend. Should we travel to Olswen and try to find the perpetrator? Ian asked while Harrison simply shook his head. There's no way that the thief would continue staying here, not after Orsted has been assassinated, hell, it could even be the same person that assassinated him that stole the items, I highly doubt we would be able to do anything to someone like that. The crown had a hand with Orsted's death, older brother sent me a letter to tell me that, he probably did it just to spite me, even the one friend I had, no matter how strained our relationship might be, turned out to be a traitor in the end. A traitor. Jonah asked in confusion before shutting his mouth. Apologies, my lord, I shouldn't meddle. It's all right, Jonah, Harrison said as he looked at him calmly. Orsted had a hand in his parents' death. The words struck the three like thunder as they stared at Harrison in shock. He had allied himself with the enemy, that idiot, to actually do something like that, I wonder if he broke our relationship on purpose so that I wouldn't get mixed up in all of that. Harrison said as he thought of the times he and Orsted spent together. It was true that the two were inseparable at one point and were like brothers. Their relationship was great until the day the old duke died. After the argument, Harrison and Orsted never talked again, hell, Harrison put spies inside the castle in order to dig out dirt that he could use against Orsted. But upon learning of the truth, Harrison had a different perspective now. Perhaps all that happened was Orsted's plan, in order to not get Harrison to fall down with him in the case of his betrayal being found out, he may have broken their relationship on purpose. Whatever it may be, we are back to step one, we don't have our weapons and armor so we can't arm ourselves, but not all is lost thankfully, we will continue with our plan in Orsfeld, you three should depart in about a week, also, don't forget to train, your power has fallen thanks to the appearance of this system and you need to regain your strength, Harrison said before heading out. But now things are different, even the talentless I can now rise up and become more powerful, I won't need to hide behind my men in the future and need protection all the time. Harrison told himself as his eyes held a dangerous light inside of them. I should go as well, killing monsters will help me get stronger, even killing that merchant has given me soul power. Harrison had received a notification from the system after killing the merchant, he was merely at level 1, and killing the merchant had given him 10 soul power, but now he knew that he could finally rise up in power and contend against his siblings in other things as well. Chapter 29 Servitude failing and Lyle in danger you are listening at novelfull.audio. Shit. 
Lyle cursed as he sped through the forest. I messed up, I really messed up this time, I should have known better than to get that close. Lyle thought as he ran as fast as he could, his limited mana being expended fast while a monster ran through the trees behind him as it pursued him. About an hour ago. Lyle had just finished another battle. He was now level 14 and was surprised to find that he was now getting two free attribute points together with two points that would randomly be allocated. That meant that he was now getting four points in total, which was double more than before he had hit level 10. The increase in stats was good, but Lyle decided to hold on to using the attribute points just yet, one never knew when he would need a boost in power so he decided to simply have them stored for now. The monster's deeper inside was of course stronger, Lyle had even come across a territory of some slimes. Slimes in the world of Corleone were a bit weird. There were many of them that belonged to the lowest ranks of monsters, but even then, they weren't easy to kill since one needed to destroy the core that was found in the center. The slimes were usually acidic and touching them would burn one's skin, flesh, and bones. The more powerful slimes simply became bigger and the acid before more powerful, some could even melt weapons the moment they touched them. Even spells wouldn't work on more powerful slimes since their acid could melt mana as well. There were different breeds and variants of slimes, of which the most powerful were the ice slimes that would constantly release frost from their bodies and could freeze over a small forest. Lava slimes lived in extremely hot areas and they would leave a trail of lava that would consume everything in their path. They could of course also use mana and bombard people with fireballs, fire breath, and more. The rarest and most powerful amongst them, however, was a type of slime that is considered extinct in the world. The Spirit Slime The spirit slimes were always incredibly rare and hard to find, but their power was something else. It was considered to be one of the most powerful monsters in Corleone and it was only about two centuries ago when the different empires of the world joined with a couple of monster clans to annihilate the spirit slimes that were led by a king. The king was said to be even more powerful than the current top powerhouses in the world. The battle took days to finish and in the end, a couple of kingdoms were almost destroyed in the aftermath. Mountains were shaken and some even collapsed, rivers were overturned and the landscape was forever changed. That was at least what everybody knew, the true story could be much different. Even Lyle decided to not disturb the slimes as it wasn't worth it. He could only use his spear to fight them, but there were many and it would take too long to kill them all. Lyle continued through the forest, fighting more powerful versions of the monsters he had come across before while also coming across some new ones such as forest fairies which were monsters that would charm one into coming close to them, they would look like the fairest of all maidens, the ideal woman that one wanted. But when one would get close enough, the fairy would change, the beautiful lady would disappear and a skinny, ugly dot looking deformity of what a human could potentially look like would attack. Lyle had come across such monsters before, he almost lost his life the first time he did so. That when he was merely starting as an assassin, he once made a mistake and had to chase his target through a forest. He found a fairy instead. Seeing the ethereal beauty in front of him made Lyle stare before coming closer to her, only to be greeted by her long claws that dug deep inside his chest. If not for the dagger that he held in his right hand and the rigorous training that made stabbing or cutting someone in the face of danger a reflex, Lyle might have died there. Upon killing the fairy, he was able to see his target lying dead on the ground, his body seemingly looking much older than before. That was what the fairies did, they would take all your vitality, all the mana, and blood in your body and store it inside of them in order to show their illusions. Lyle fought the fairy that he came across in the forest, but didn't kill her. He grabbed her before plunging his fangs deep inside her neck. He wanted to make her a servant of his. He knew that once someone got bitten, their appearance would change. If the fairy turned out to look like a human after being changed by him, then he could easily bring her with him anywhere. Her illusions would become a great help to him when it came to fighting powerful monsters or people. Unfortunately, what Lyle got was a notification. Warning, the host is currently not powerful enough to turn monsters into servants, only humans can be turned into servants before the host becomes more powerful. 
the fairy started convulsing before collapsing to the ground. Her body started shaking while her blood boiled before finally dying. Lyle sighed, it seems he had no choice but to find a person he could turn, but he wouldn't just grab any random person and change them to a vampire, he wasn't a cold-hearted killer that would do such things without a care in the world. No, he still had his principles. He would only change a person that tried to harm him. With that thought in his head, Lyle turned around and wandered deeper inside the forest. Finally, Lyle came to a huge tree. The forest always had a couple of relatively big trees inside of it, they were used as a sort of landmark for the adventures so that they wouldn't lose their way. One thing was different, however, as there was something weird right at the bottom of the tree. A couple of monsters were lying down and sleeping right at the base of the tree. Each one was about one meter long and had thick fur that covered its body. Their breath alone was very powerful and could be heard even from a couple of meters away. Lyle stared at the monsters in wonder before looking around and getting near them after not spotting anyone. As he got about 10 meters close to the monsters, he was able to see what they were. Oh no, was the first thing on Lyle's mind. The monsters that were sleeping in front of Lyle were iron bears. They were amongst the most powerful creatures that one could find in the forest and were right below the night realm. One thing that everybody knew about them was that they had an incredibly good sense of smell. Lyle knew that he had made a mistake. He was hasty, he just wanted to get a glimpse of what monsters were down in order to decide whether he would attack them or not. But iron bears were different. These bears in front of him were just cubs, and when cubs were involved, the mama bear would never be far away. Just the smell that Lyle would leave here would be enough to make the bear angry and potentially come after him. Bears were very territorial and incredibly protective of their cubs. Lyle quickly turned around and started running away, but not even three seconds had passed before an angry roar echoed through the forest. The mama bear had arrived, and she was able to both smell Lyle's scent and hear his movement. Upon learning that another creature had come so close to her cubs, the bear became enraged. It stared back at another bear that suddenly charged at Lyle while the mother stayed with the cubs. The other bear was of course the father. Iron bears mated for life and usually never left the side of their partner. Upon learning that the cubs had been in danger, the male would usually charge at the enemy while the slightly smaller mother would stay at the cubs in order to protect them. The powerful bear charged forward and rammed into trees that were on its way. The trees were unable to stop it as its powerful body crushed them without much difficulty. Lyle sped up and ran with all of his might, he knew that if the bear was to get to him, he would be in serious trouble. The power that such a monster possessed was not something that he could hope to go against right now. Even though his weapons were powerful and could penetrate through the body, he was not powerful enough to fully activate them and damage the monster. He suddenly looked back, only to find that the bear was gaining on him. If he was to estimate the bear's power, it was at least about level 40, which was much, much more powerful compared to him. He stared ahead and grit his teeth before using a skill that he hadn't used for a long time, one that he wasn't sure would even work. Blood Knight, Ignition <laughs>